All right. Thank you so much. Welcome to another episode of the Love Hope Lime podcast. My name is Fred Diamond. I'm the author of Love Hope Lime, what family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor need to know. And of course, I'm the host of this podcast, the Love Hope Lime podcast. Susan, we do a show every single week. We post the show Monday at 7.30 p.m. Hey, you can find my book on Amazon.com. Just want to let people know, as I've done from day one, the e-version, the PDF of the book is always free for chronic Lyme survivors. So just reach out to me via Facebook, LinkedIn, or go to freddiamond.com and hit one of the contact us, uh, one of the contact us forms, and I'll get you the PDF of the book. Again, it's free, complimentary to all chronic Lyme survivors. So as people know, frequent listeners know, when I wrote the book, I met some amazing leaders in the Lyme community, doctors, medical practitioners, charity directors, and they've helped me to understand what living with Lyme is all about. So on the podcast, I've invited them to share their insights into how you can support those that you love with chronic Lyme. And if you're a chronic Lyme survivor, this podcast has also uh, helped, I've learned, Susan, it's also helped chronic Lyme survivors know how to ask for support, how to tell those in their life what they need from support, which to be honest with you, is something I really didn't anticipate. But a lot of people with chronic Lyme have reached out to me and said that the lessons they've heard from people like you and all the people I've had on previous episodes have helped them understand that. We transcribe every episode. So you could find all the back episodes at freddiamond.com and click on the love, hope, lime button, freddiamond.com, click on the love, hope, lime button. So I'm excited today. My guest is Susan Pogorelski with Lime Brave Foundation. Susan, I said your name right, correct? Yeah, kind of close. Pogorzelski. Uh, Pogorzelski. <laughs> Yes. Susan Pogers, okay. Anyway, so uh, tell us a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about Lyme Brave Foundation, and uh, we'll get started with the questions. So I am a chronic Lyme patient. I had Lyme for 20 years before I was formally diagnosed, and it has been about 10 years in, well, it'll be 11 years in May um, since that diagnosis. So it's been quite a while, 2012. Um, I am the founder of Lyme Brave Foundation. It's a 5013C nonprofit organization that really focuses on the hope and the healing. Um, so it really is in line with what you've created, which I think is really beautiful. We provide awareness resources, education resources for both patients and caregivers along this journey with a real focus on the emotional toll. What I found on my journey is that a lot of people, myself included, felt very isolated, felt very alone on their journey. And it was not just the physical toll that this illness creates, but the emotional toll, that abandonment, that feeling isolated, that feeling lonely, that feeling like you're not heard or seen. And so we really wanted to create a place, a safe space for people to be able to have those resources and have that community as well. Um, I'm also, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, keep going. Uh, I'm also the author of The Last Letter. I actually wrote this during a relapse. Um, this is a novel that is based on my own experiences with Lyme disease. It's a fictionalized uh, version of my own experiences that follows a young girl who goes through her diagnosis and how it affects her family and loved ones around her as well. That's actually fascinating. So one thing that I was surprised about when I started my journey to understand how Lyme disease had affected somebody uh, very close to me is that there were so many 501c3s created by people who had Lyme disease and had gotten to a point where they were capable of giving back. They wanted to create something because as you said, and as frequent listeners know, and everybody who here is listening with chronic Lyme, there are so many issues with this disease, not mm -hmm. just the health related issues of which, of which there's tons, not just the, the mental and the relationship, there's political and social things with this disease that are just absolutely insane. And the costs are just absolutely insane. Why did you create Live Lime, Brown, Lime Brave Foundation? I understand what the mission is, but tell us what drove you personally to feel the need to do this. I truly did not want anybody to suffer the way I had suffered. Um, and there was so much pain and there was so much suffering. And I just thought, I don't want anybody to experience what I have. And I think that's the driving force behind why a lot of people create those foundations and create those organizations is because you don't want to, anybody to experience what you have. 
um, there is this component of knowing that we're not alone and, and sharing our stories and having that compassion and the empathy and having that validation that, yeah, I'm not crazy. And yeah, I'm not alone in my experience. But at the same time, you don't want people to experience what you've experienced. Um, and so to be able to provide those resources and to be able to provide that community to say, hey, you're not alone in what you're experiencing if you are experiencing that. And so you can get get better, or at least you have that community behind you and backing you up. I think that that really becomes a driving force of, of just not wanting anybody to suffer the way that you had to turn that pain into something, to turn that pain into some kind of purpose. Yeah, that, that's beautiful the way you just described it. And I've, I've met so many people who have done similar things. Um, and, and you're right, it's because there isn't a whole lot of support. I mean, there's a lot of entities that are available to support, but most people are trying to get support from each other. You know, mm -hmm. the Lyme groups, I was shocked when I saw that some of these Lyme groups, uh, the Facebook groups and Instagram groups, you know, had like 20, 30,000 know, male members just uh, talking to each other, asking you know, questions. And actually, to be honest with you, Susan, one of the sad things for me is I see people popping on some of these groups every day, asking questions that I've seen over the last two years. So there's no, uh, unfortunately, uh, hopefully at some point, there'll be an end to this disease in the world, but, but it continues to grow. Uh, what are three things then that family members, partners, and friends need to know about what their loved one is going through? Well, I do want to say first, if I may, that that's actually what saved my life. Um, because I was going to hospitals, some of the top teaching hospitals, um, trying to find a diagnosis. It was six months when I was really, my heart was failing, my brain was failing, when I was really struggling. And so it was a message board that actually, I was doing my own research and I found a message board with similar symptoms. And it was people sharing their stories that helped me find a diagnosis and ultimately get better on, on my healing path. Um, so there is really something to be said for those support groups. Yeah, we talk about that in the book, the whole concept of crowd curing, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, in no disrespect to the medical profession, especially the ones who do treat Lyme, but, you know, everybody has unique symptoms. You all have your history. Uh, you know, there's the mental side that comes from where you were. So there's so many different factors where you live, you know, what else you've had to deal with. So so thanks for that. And actually, one of the great things about these groups is that there are people who talk about what they've done. You know, here's what I've done and here's what I've don't done, uh, what I haven't done or, you know, but it all got to kind of take it, not with a grain of salt, but apply it to, to what you do. So again, to the question. So what do you want to tell family members, partners and friends? What should they know about what you're going through when you have this disease? Um, the first thing that I would probably say is that this is not a choice that somebody experiences this. And I think that there can be a lot of judgment because it is such a misunderstood disease. And it, it's just, it's not a choice. It's an experience that happens, um, but nobody wants to be sick. Nobody wants to experience the pain and the suffering that comes through this. Um, so to allow for that compassion and to not have that judgment and have that open mind um, can really be supportive for the patient. Um, I think too, I, as I said before, I took notes because my brain is still <laughs> trying to work here. Um, I think too, to understand that um, a patient's world gets kind of turned all upside down when they're diagnosed with a disease. Um, and so they really do struggle with feelings of abandonment, feelings of isolation. And not only that, but when I said their world gets turned upside down, they're not the same person that they were prior to the illness. The illness really catalyzes them to a new way of being. They, they have to live differently. They have to, in, in essence, be differently. It really changes them inside and out. Um, so to have compassion for that, I think compassion really is the key word here. Um, and to understand too, that those with chronic illness, especially Lyme disease, you're fighting an invisible battle every single day, every single day, you're, you're, you're battling an illness, you're, you're fighting something that is invisible to people around you who might not have to experience that. So again, compassion really is the key component here. I'm just curious, how long did you go before you got diagnosed with Lyme disease? I was 13 years old when I first got sick, but we didn't know it was Lyme disease until I was in my late twenties. So that was between, it was almost 20 years. Wow. Yeah. What did you think you had? Just curious. What did you, I mean, I don't mean to get oh personal. Boy, I was what did you... Yeah. I was diagnosed with everything from the very first time I got sick. It was mono. 
Um, that was right after I had been on a camping trip. So the fact that we didn't put two and two together, but that was, you know, back in the nineties when yeah. Lyme disease wasn't really, we didn't have that awareness as we do now. Um, and then, um, I was diagnosed with everything from anxiety, depression. They said just weight gain. They said PCOS, um, POTS. I mean, the, the list just grew and grew and grew. And mm -hmm. I always said to myself, how is it that I have all these conditions and there's not one root cause it didn't make logical sense for me and that's what made me pursue on my own just keep doing research and that's when i found this message board of people who had a similar experience and a similar story when you put two and two to, if you don't mind my asking mm -hmm. when you put two and two together and you realize gee i might have lyme disease was there tell me that emotion on that day or whatever when you said Oh, it, either it was a doctor or you or a family member, whoever, when you discovered or realized, wow, I might have this thing called Lyme disease. Um, well, I can tell you a quick story. Um, I was at my wit's end. I had just gone to Johns Hopkins and I had thought that it might be Lyme disease at that point. And I asked them for the testing and they said, no, we don't think you have Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. And so I was crying to my mom on the phone. I, I was living in my house at the time. I was crying to my mom on the phone. I said, I can't do this anymore. I can't fight. I give up. And she said, I'll keep fighting for you. If you need to give up, she's like, I'm going to, I'm never going to give up. I'll keep fighting for you. The very next day, somebody answered my request or my inquiry on that message board. And it gave me the name of a doctor. And I called that doctor and I spoke for two hours on the phone with his wife, who was the nurse practitioner. And she just verified even symptoms that I didn't know were symptoms at the time. She verified everything I was experiencing. And I cried with just genuine relief. I felt like it was a miracle because yeah. um, I was just at that point of just complete giving up. I, yeah. I thought that it, that was going to be it for me. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate what you just said about your mother. Um, along the lines of that, what is your advice for what they shouldn't be doing? What shouldn't family members, friends and partners be doing? I think the, the greatest thing is don't expect your partner, your son, daughter, friend to be who they were. Um, like I said, your entire life gets turned upside down by this illness. You're not who you used to be and you can't go back to whether that's in your physical world, like going back to a job or or maintaining the stamina that you once had, or even emotionally, you know, it, it, this disease can be really traumatic in and of itself when you experience it because of the pain and the suffering and not just that, but because of the emotional toll that you experience. And so have that compassion as they're going through their not just physical healing journey, but the emotional healing journey. Um, and and allow yourself to grow with them. Allow yourself to, to, you know, not just expect them to go right back once they're healed or once they're at a certain state in their functionality to go back to the life that they led or who they were, because this disease does change you. Um, I always say it, this disease was a catalyst to me really becoming a better version of myself and a stronger version of myself and more of an advocate and having more of a voice. Um, it's not, you're not who you were before, before the illness. So, yeah. Yeah. So what should they expect, you know, as their loved one's journey continues and, you know, it's kind of interesting what you just talked about your, your journey. There's, it's not just like, you know, you're recovering from a broken ankle, you know, where it's like, you break the ankle, you get in the cast, you sit on the couch and watch, you know, binge Netflix or something for, for six months, six weeks, you know, with his Lyme disease, like you said, there's, you were diagnosed with multiple things, right? You were a teenager. So you had a lot of other things kind of going on in your life, right? You know, you're trying to figure out a lot of these things, you know, so you're just not just like, who am I, but like, who am I as I'm always sick, right? So you know, give some insights into what some things they should expect as their loved ones continue, a journey continues. I think just giving an allowance, allowing that space, allowing that growth, allowing yourself to, allowing them to have that experience that they're experiencing and just holding that space and, and having that compassion for them and having that sense of connection and community because especially when you are a patient and, and I can speak to, to caregivers as well because um, that's where we focus. We focus on caregivers and patients, but especially for patients, you know, it's such an isolating illness where it really feels like we're on our own because we're experiencing this illness on our own essentially like within our own bodies um and within our own mental states um that i think that 
connection and community is going to be really, really important. Um, and so, again, it just keeps coming back to compassion, have that compassion and have that patience and just, you know, just keep loving them as, mm -hmm. as you always did, but also give room for, um, for the illness and for the healing of that illness. All right. Once again, I want to thank you. Make sure I say your, your last name correctly. Susan Pogorowski. Pogorzelski. I, I, you know, I took the Z out because I thought I had said it wrong. Susan <laughs> Pogorzelski with Lime Brave. Uh, is there a way that people can best way people to reach out to you about Lime Brave Foundation? Sure. Our website is www.limebravefoundation.org. Um, and I'm always happy to hear from patients and caregivers alike. All right. Any final thoughts? Anything last thing that you want to say to make sure we get your complete story before we wrap up here? And first of all, by the way, I just want to acknowledge you. Um, like I said, I've, I've, been astounded at how many people I've met over the last two years who are so committed to giving back. And I had seen, you know, your the Lime Bray Foundation pop up, you know, time and time again as I was meeting more people. And every time I would meet somebody, I, I was getting three, five, 10 people a day reaching out, you know, to a friend or whatever. And then frequently I would see, you know, your picture and the Lime Bray Foundation. So, you know, I just want to acknowledge that what you've created has provided value. And Hell's helped um, so many people, uh, you know, just get a deeper understanding and, and understanding how they could be more supportive and more loving of, of people in their lives and of themselves. So I just want to acknowledge you for that. And then final thought, anything you want to leave us with? I really appreciate that. Um, I've actually taken a little bit of a step back with Lime Brave, um, but those resources are still there. Um, all the posts are still there um, because we really want to empower you to, to be brave and, and to know that you're not alone in this journey for, again, both patients and caregivers. So um, just, just keep being brave and keep being strong. And, and just I've really seen a lot of people who are going through this experience, picking up the mantle of awareness and education. And I think that's incredible. And I think that's the direction that we need to continue to head. So connection, community, awareness, education, I think that is what's really going to make a difference um, when it comes to, to this devastating illness. So thank you for the work that you're doing too. I thank you so much. I want to thank Susan for being a guest on today's Love Hope Lime podcast. My name is Fred Diamond.